So uh, this is a really great book. And rather than giving me giving me giving a preamble about it, I think you should learn about it from our conversation. So I'm just going to start by saying, uh, Nicole, um, why does capital need new profits, and what do you mean by this term? This is a, it's an it's a great thing because you know sometimes with a book title, you just you know you have to think of something that is going to get people to pick up the book, but this is a great title because it is actually the argument of the book. So that was a good choice on the part of the author and the publisher. So let's talk about that. Um, w what are these new profits of capital and why does capital need them? I, I recently uh, read a book about a year ago by Luke Boltanski and Eva Cipello called The New Spirit of Capitalism. Uh, and it's a French book and it's about management practices uh, in France and how they, uh, there's this kind of response after the 60s uh, to deal with kind of social unrest and looking about how capital and, and capitalism actually evolved through that crisis. And one of the things that they really emphasize is how flexible uh, capitalism is as a system. And, and one of the reasons why it's, it's able to get through these, these sometimes deep bouts of crisis is its ability to incorporate ideas that really uh, challenge uh, and critique the system. And so I started thinking about that. Well, how can we think about that uh, at, a, at, a, at a societal level? And, and, and one of the things that I noticed was that you know, in the last few years after the Great Recession, we're really seeing a lot of uh, critical voices out there, um, really uh, kind of challenging some of the big problems that we see in society, like uh, environmental degradation and alienation and gender inequality. And some of the most powerful kind of voices critiquing capitalism are people like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates and Sheryl Sandberg and, and Oprah and John Mackey. Uh, and, and, and one of the things I was thinking about when I, when I was looking at the types of solutions that they pose, which are very much in line with, uh, you know, the kind of status quo, status quo and the, the, the sort of for-profit uh, system that we have, I started thinking about how necessary those voices are for actually allowing capital to evolve over time and actually get through these bouts of crisis, but without actually challenging any of the, the sort of underlying drives that cause these problems in the first place. So I wanted to sort of draw attention to, to these kinds of stories that are being told because they're very appealing to people who want to actually solve some of the problems that we see out there, but at the same time, I think we should be very critical and see them as actually kind of, you know, uh, paradoxically strengthening the system by actually allowing uh, it to evolve through some of these, these crises. Okay. Um, let's start with, um, you know, and there's a kind of a buzz around every single one of these people for precisely the reasons that Nicole identifies. Um, because um, they are they are people who um, have an effect an, um, a very badly needed critique of the system as it is and um, and yet they have a story about how capitalism can be used to solve the problem um, and and this is this is of course very compelling let's start let's start with Cheryl Sandberg what's 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 her story Cheryl Sandberg is, is very interesting, and, and, and she's actually the first person that I look at, and she was actually one of the first uh, people that I actually started doing research on for this book. And one of the reasons why is because so many women that I interact with uh, are really impressed with her and the kind of story she's telling. Uh, uh, women that I work with uh, in academia, but also other professional women, and just you know people in, in, in my social networks. And, and something kind of struck me uh, as, as a bit odd about her story. And so she's really, you know, she believes in the feminist project and she really believes in equality for women. Uh, but she has a particular uh, sort of, you know, manifesto and action plan for how, how to achieve this. Uh, and it's really appealing for women because it, it uh, you know, on the surface it says that women should be equal and should, we should seize positions of power and this is the, the route to uh, actually solving these sort of deep, you know, problems of gender inequality. But when you really start to peel back her story and look at it, uh, this, the story is a bit problematic. She's really sort of 
challenging women to overcome this inequality by working harder and harder and, and, and climbing the sort of, she, she says, climbing uh, the jungle gym of corporate capitalism uh, and, and sort of getting to the top of corporate America. And, and I think that there are parts of her story which are valuable. I do think that women need to stop worrying about being perfect mothers, wives, daughters, and so on. Uh, but by channeling our desires for equality uh, and, and, and feminism through sort of corporate America and trying to reach the top of corporate America as a way to uh, achieve the goals of feminism, uh, this, this doesn't actually compute. You know, sort of all the feminist strategies are not actually compatible with each other because by getting to the top of you know, these big Fortune 500 companies, uh, you sort of are you know, kind of burnishing the meritocratic facade of corporate America in a way that actually undermines uh, the struggles of a lot of women who are really only going to improve their livelihoods by you know, organizing together. Uh, and, and formal unions. But someone like Sandberg has a lot of power. She has, she, her message is really seductive uh, and it appeals to a lot of women. So when she uh, is really out there telling women to, lead in, to lean in, it kind of drowns out a lot of other kind of bad stories. So that's what I was trying to get at uh, by, by, by focusing on her. So, I mean, this is really, this is really I think, important. You say, um, all feminist strategies are not compatible. I mean, and I think that that's, you know, that's very interesting because you, you get, if, if you criticize Sheryl Sandberg, a lot, of, a lot of her defenders will say, well, okay, that's not your strategy, but you know, what's wrong with trying to get a few more women onto the Facebook board, right? And, um, but, but you say, no, actually, this, um, this is at odds with a vision of liberation for all women. But if the strategy is to get a few more women in power, and women should try to seize positions of power, that's fine, and I think it will probably work out pretty well, especially because women who really do kind of lean in and work hard will achieve a lot of success when they're in these kind of high power positions. But she presents it as a manifesto uh, for the feminist movement. Uh, and saying and that we'll take it that yeah, way. Yeah, and definitely, and saying that we don't really need to worry about, you know, uh, what types of tactics and strategies we use. And that's where I think the problem uh, arises. Because when you channel your struggles through, uh, uh, you know, corporate America, and your goal is, you know, in sort of strengthening and making these companies really profitable, and you link feminism to this goal, then it becomes a problem. Because not all women can achieve their goals through this, this route. And by making these companies look just right, and justified, uh, it then undermines the struggles of other women who need to really only just work together uh, to, 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 to gain you know, and struggle collectively. Uh, so I think that's an important distinction. You give a, a very effective example of um, you know, the, the limitations of thinking that um, more female bosses are going to uplift the, um, uh, the the masses of women workers. You you you, you tell you tell a, a story about um, about Sandberg and how she she was pregnant and she realized there was no parking um, for the um, you know that it was it was such a pain to walk from her parking spot to the office and there should be pregnant lady parking and so she voila she was the boss so she could institute pregnant lady parking, you know so that's great. Um, but, but then you give a co very contrasting story of Marissa Mayer at Yahoo. Tell us about that and what, um, what, what you conclude from that. Well, I, I, gave the, I, gave, I put the anecdote about Marissa Mayer in, not to attack Marissa Mayer, but just to oh. sort of challenge this sort of, you know, first of all, we can just think about uh, Margaret Thatcher, right, as an historical example of why putting women into power is not necessarily all it takes. Uh, and of course, you know, Susan Faludi and other women have made this point many times, but Marissa Mayer, uh, you know, is a contemporary uh, of Sandberg, and, and, and when she, uh, you know, got into power at Yahoo, one of the first things that she actually did was eliminate the ability of employees to telecommute, which is, you know, eliminated their ability to uh, organize their own schedule in a somewhat flexible way so they could work at home from one day a week, which is uh, very important for working women in particular who, who often have extra child care and elder care responsibilities placed upon them. And many people actually chose to work at Yahoo uh, because it offered this type of employment structure. So 
just as an example to say that certainly not, you know, we can't rely on, on sisterly solidarity uh, and having, you know, women in power. There's something fundamentally different about women. We are socialized in different ways, uh, but putting women into an already an exploitative uh, system is not going to achieve the goals of feminism. It's sort of a fascinating um, vision, right, because the goal is to become the boss. And and it and it it depends on you know the idea that you're going to do something really benevolent once you become the boss, and that idea is an interesting transition to um, talk about the Whole Food CEO um, Bob Mackey. Um, when um, when when I spent a little time at Columbia Business School a number of years ago. The, um, these kinds of people, these eco-conscious capitalists, were like the nicest people. Um, you know, in you know, in contrast with the rest of the people who just you know wanted to um, you know be sharks on you know and you know run their own hedge fund and destroy the world and you know and didn't care. You know, these kinds of people who were very idealistic about what they were going to do. Um, with their business, um, we're, we're we're very appealing, and you know, at a moment where there is not much, um, where there, at at that time there was very little grassroots um, left movement um, to um, to change um, capitalism. You kind of thought, well, maybe that's the only hope. You know, these like the, 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 if these capitalists start worrying about the environment a little bit more, so. Um, you know this this figure, John Mackey, um, emerges as the most prominent and probably most successful of those types of figures. Um, wh what's his story? Mm. Mackey Mackey's an interesting uh, individual. He's actually probably he's the least wealthy of any of the prophets that I talk about in the mm -hmm. book, and has probably given up the most of of his wealth. Uh, he hasn't taken a paycheck. He do he's donated his shares, and in many ways, he really. Uh, is a re he's a real true believer uh, in kind of conscious capitalism and, and, and his kind of model for, uh, you know, making the world a better place. And, and he's a true believer in kind of neoclassical uh, economics. So in that sense, he's, he's, he's appealing because he really does believe what he's saying. Um, and you're right in, in the sense that this whole kind of conscious capitalism and eco-capitalism uh, movement that emerges, and it's really popular these mm -hmm. days, and it's totally linked into kind of lifestyle politics and people hoping to, uh, you know, make the world better through purchasing better things. I mean, this is really uh, one of the main strategies, and one of the reasons why is, as you say, really the environmental movement hits a wall in the 90s, and the state, you know, with globalization, uh, people feel like the state is less capable of actually protecting populations, uh, while at the same time corporations are stronger than ever. Right? We have these giant transnational corporations. So, and you know, in one hand, some someone like Mackey in the story he's telling uh, seems to make sense, right? If we just implement sustainable business practices, and many many companies are actually doing this. Uh, big companies like Walmart and Nestle, it seems like this is the best strategy. Um, but when you start to, to, to peel away the layers, it, again, it, it, it becomes problematic. And one of the main reasons why uh, is because there are inbuilt drives to capitalism. And the only ways that a company like Whole Foods can actually stay in business is to keep expanding and producing more. So the whole kind of eco-business model is never about reducing how much companies are producing or changing the ways we consume or dispose of products. It's about uh, staying competitive in an increasingly resource-starved global economy, and that's really what these kinds of practices are about. Now, Mackey really ties it into something about, uh, you know, saying that somehow his company will uh, escape these kinds of constraints of capitalism. Uh, but so far, his model has been based on uh, a kind of monopoly strategy. Whole Foods is now the biggest uh, whole f uh, sort of whole f organic food company, uh, food store in the world. Um, and, and, and also, it, it, you know, uh, it, it hasn't really uh, been doing this for, for very long. It doesn't really have a lot of competitors. Right? So if we think about kind of the inbuilt drives uh, of competition, uh, these things aren't sustainable. They have to, they have to keep expanding and growing. So this is really a, a real fundamental problem. 
The other problem with the backing model, which people don't necessarily uh, want to talk about either, uh, is just that there is a difference. He says that sort of all shareholders are equal, right? So the business owner and the environment and workers are all we're all stakeholders in, in the in 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 in, in, uh, in the firm, um, and that we're all sort of you know uh, going to benefit from it in an equal way. But this is again just not really possible. Uh, you know, people who work at Whole Foods may make slightly better wages than people who work at Walmart, but it's not a democratic institution. So when the environmental movements uh, channel, again, their demands through these big companies, it becomes part of their business strategy and a, a part of their strategy to sort of compete and stay alive in, a, in an increasingly resource-starved global economy. This eco-conscious image is clearly a part of Mackey's competitive strategy. I mean, how well would it work if everybody, you know, if everybody were um, you know, running a company just like Whole Foods, it wouldn't be, it, it, it wouldn't be a competitive advantage. No, and, and he admits that, but you know, he says if Walmart tries to be Whole Foods, then then they'll be out of luck. Uh, but he's very he's very uh, confident in the creativity of entrepreneurs like himself. But also, as you're saying, it's really tied into the way that uh, the whole environment, environmental movement has shifted to kind of a focus on the self and on people's buying purchases and, and the types of goods we're buying and how much that's really uh, linked up to our identity. And this is something that we don't just need to scoff at and make fun of people who buy uh, organic food. I think it really speaks to a deep desire that people mm -hmm. have to not you know, destroy the planet on which we live. And so mm -hmm. the reason why I think it's worth you know, taking seriously this desire, why do people shop at Whole Foods? It's not just to make ourselves feel better, it's because we really you know, are trying to come up with a way uh, to you know, kind of stop the relentless destruction of, of, of the planet that we're living on. And so I think it's worth you know, telling the story of Mackie so we can channel that desire into kind of struggles that will actually uh, you know, uh, stop some of the, the some of the destruction that's caused by these companies. But that those those kinds of struggles have to be channeled through democratic organizations, and companies are not that. And speaking of democratic organizations, um, you want to tell us a little bit about how Mackey has reacted when employees at Whole Foods have attempted to um, democratize their workplace by forming unions. Mm. Well, I, I mean, as, if any of you have followed Mackey at all, he's notoriously uh, anti-union, which is not surprising. Most uh, most uh, corporate CEOs. types are. Yeah. Um, he's he's likened them to having herpes. Uh, and and interestingly enough, uh, the sort of well-being of Whole Foods workers is is not uh, you know in all cases a lot better than than other workers. For example, in Massachusetts, uh, a huge number of Whole Foods workers actually uh, qualify for Medicaid. And there were actually a lot of Whole Food workers out on the line in the Fight for uh, uh, 15 campaign in a number of cities, including Chicago. So, uh, you know, definitely people who work at Whole Foods are, are, are very, I think, much more critical of the whole kind of vision than people who shop at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> Do you shop at Whole Foods? I try not to shop at Whole Foods, uh, but I do occasionally shop there. They have really good tea. <laughs> you know that um, I mean, uh, you, you touched on that uh, that idea of this the self under neoliberalism and the way that the, the Whole Foods taps into that. Um, I, there, I was reading this, um, this great essay in N Plus One the other day that. Um, that, that asks the question, how does neoliberalism feel? It feels like shit. So, you know, that's true, right? And, um, and, and of your prophets, the one who emerges to um, address that problem, of course, is Oprah. Um, how, what's her solution? One of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons why I put Oprah in there is, is because my, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly and is probably the smartest and most competent person I know, loves Oprah. Uh, she has completely uh, internalized her message. Uh, but what's interesting is it's not just my mother-in-law; it's also my students who I teach uh, sociology to. They have also completely internalized this kind of neoliberal message. They're very aware. Uh, how sort of uncertain their job prospects are, how tough it is out there. Um, but their solution is to focus on themselves and their 
affect themselves. They, they're constantly, uh, you know, talking about how they want to uh, develop new skills, maybe double major and double minor. They want to do internships. Uh, they want to, uh, you know, do a study abroad. And it's always this focus on how can they perfect themselves to survive in this increasingly stressful world. My mother-in-law, on the other hand, her, the, her, her takeaway from Oprah is that we have to be positive. We have to be grateful for adversity, uh, and the things that happen to us are about making us a stronger person so we can adapt to this world out there. And I think this message is, is pervasive. Uh, and so I really, and the, Oprah is not the only person, uh, certainly, who's saying this, but she's really the one who says it with, uh, she articulates it most thoughtfully and most clearly, uh, and she has so much power and reach to share this this message that really, uh, you know, uh, and I, I, I quote in the book, all Americans consume Oprah whether or not they realize it. Uh, so I think it's, 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 it's something interesting to start to, to start to peel away. Do you think the gratitude in itself is part of the, uh, is part of the neoliberal message? I mean, I've been wondering about this for a number of years because it, that, that aspect of her message I think is really um, is, is, is really incorporated into most of our daily consciousness, you know, that uh, exhortation to feel grateful and be grateful. But what's, what's, what are the implications know, that's, that's, of that, really? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, we could just talk about that. Uh, I think it's, again, it's this interesting kind of combination of so the ne neoliberalism, you know, focuses on the self that will find the solutions mm -hmm. to society's problems by fixing ourselves, which is actually, I, I draw a lot in the book from uh, Janice Peck, who's written a brilliant book called The Age of Oprah, where she likens uh, sort of the message of Oprah and neoliberalism to the messages that were swirling around in the Gilded Age uh, in, the, in the late 19th century talking about how, you know, this sort of uh, focus on the self. So one of the interesting things here, again, is that, uh, you know, part of this kind of focus on the self is not just that people are really self-involved. Uh, it's that we really desire a self-actualization, something that we value in our society, and it's an interesting sort of byproduct of neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of focus on the self also brings with it a desire to be happy, be creative, which are the things that were being demanded in the 60s and 70s, right? To have autonomy, to have freedom. So when these things, you know, get channeled in uh, to this message, it gets a little uh, kind of murky. So it's not, there's nothing wrong with achieving self-actualization because that's what we want, right? And that's a, that's a desirable goal in itself. It's just the, the question of how to get there. Uh, and, 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 and more importantly, this idea that the reason why you're not getting there and you hate your job and you're not able to find a job uh, is because you haven't really worked out what's inside and you haven't, you know, perfected yourself uh, enough. And so the gratitude comes along with it, right? Uh, you shouldn't be f angry that you're, you're facing adversity, right? You should be grateful and use it as a learning experience. And so that in itself is very much part of the neoliberal project. Mm -hmm. you, um, you, you, met, you mentioned in that chapter um, a woman who is, um, who was exhorted by Oprah that she should feel grateful for um, being fired? Like you know that you know because being fired is I mean you, you, is is a sign that you were not in the right job, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean that really blew me away. Yeah, I mean that's that's a particularly extreme example. Uh, there was a woman, but it's a very telling example. It is a telling example. Sort of, not only should you be grateful for having someone clue you in that this wasn't the job for you, uh, but also to view the situation as as a time to gain more skills, go back to school, network. You know, all of these ways that you can again uh, direct the focus back to yourself for why you are in this uh, situation, rather than say, "Hey, all of these other people are in the exact same situation as me." Uh, we've all gone to school, we have massive student loans, and we've done the things that we're supposed to do. Why aren't we actually achieving security and self-actualization? I think this is part of why, you know, what, what some of the emotions swirling around in the Occupy movement. Uh, you have a lot of young people uh, who, you know, did all of the things they were supposed to do, but, you know, weren't finding what they were, you know, promised to find. And I think that's, that's really what we're seeing now. You draw an interesting contrast between those stories 
from the um, th from the Gilded Age of self um, of of self actualization and Oprah's story. I mean, the, and it, it's it's a it's a rather dramatic difference, actually. Can can you um, spell that out between the between the Horatio Alger stories and um, and Oprah's stories? I mean, there's there's obviously um, there's obviously a parallel there, but the but but the difference is striking. Yeah, uh, well, Oprah is often compared to Horatio Alger, and she's actually won the Horatio Alger Award, uh, which is given to people who overcome adversity and uh, uh, focus on education, which she does. She has a, a very posh boarding school that she runs in, in South Africa. Uh, but the interesting, and Richard Weiss has a brilliant book on uh, American uh, myths. Anyone should check it out if, if, if they're interested in the Gilded Age in particular. And, and, and he talks about the Horatio Alger stories as uh, the goal in those stories was always sort of to have, uh, to achieve a kind of middle class job, a respectable job, um, but it was always kind of luck and uh, meeting the right people right. Who, who allowed uh, the, the plucky protagonist to, to get this job. Like I us. think you give an example of rescuing a rich person from some terrible accident. Yeah. Uh, usually, the, yeah, so uh, the, a typical story would have the protagonist saving the, the banker's daughter from being flattened by a falling <laughs> safe or <laughs> fall from, falling from a window, something like that. Uh, but the exciting thing about Oprah is that she, she, doesn't, uh, she doesn't buy these stories at all. She says her uh, success in life is, is not a result of luck or being in the right place at the right time. She really is, is very much uh, uh, a proponent of the idea that she has worked hard and she has uh, achieved excellence and she is excellent in everything that she does and she thinks positively. She sends out positive, you know, the Rhonda Burns kind of message. She, she's sending out positive messages and thoughts and they're coming back to reward her. And in that sense, it's much more exciting to emulate because it's not about luck, right? It's just about uh, working hard and you know, putting in the sweat equity and then uh, achieving the, the rewards for this. And this, I think, is, is a very kind of uh, da dangerous uh, uh, conclusion for, for younger people in particular, because uh, I see my students, they're, they're, they, each, every semester they seem more sem stressed out than the semester before. Uh, and it's because they've really internalized this, this kind of uh, idea that they just need to work harder. It's quite a contrast. I mean, in a time where just basic middle class security is so difficult for so many people to achieve through their sweat equity and like you know self confidence, you know, I mean, you know, to um, to to aspire to um, be Oprah is um, almost. Um, I mean, it's it, it's it's sort of. Um, I mean, it's it's almost a parody of what you could aspire to, right? Well, Oprah's an amazing person. I think of all the prophets, she's clearly the most amazing of any of them because she really did have a very tough upbringing and she really embodies the American dream. But one of the things, and, 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 uh, and why Richard Weiss makes this point in a very nice way also, is basically saying when you're, one of the things about these stories is not necessarily, and this is the sort of potential for them, uh, when they're shown to be false over and over again, uh, you know, that we can't all live like Oprah, is that the stories themselves become fuel for change. Because really this kind of idea of the American dream and our, our desire to, to, to follow the life of Oprah, it's not that we necessarily believe that that's how life is, but that that's how life should be. Mm -hmm. And so when we're seeing these kind of stories, you know, thrown in our face as, as something that we can't achieve, I think it becomes a fuel for for organizing and seeing something beyond ourselves, right? Something, uh, a need to, to organize in a way that doesn't focus on the self, but that actually challenges the status quo through a kind of collective project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and, and, and you see that collective project happening um, elsewhere, right? I mean, you mentioned Occupy Wall Street and um, and in the last in the in the conclusion of your book, you talk a little bit about um, about collective projects and um, and um, people who are um, challenging capitalism and starting to tell different kinds of stories. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I mean, one of the sort of premises of the book is that these kind of critical voices, you know, critical voices of 
Oprah or Sandberg or the Gates or Mackey, I make the argument that they actually strengthen capital and mm -hmm. strengthen the, the status quo by sort of allowing it to evolve. But the conclusion that I don't want to come to is that you know anything we do is 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 harmless or, or pointless, and you know, and it's not actually going to challenge capital because I don't think that's actually true at all. Um, and I think that there are projects that do fundamentally challenge the status quo. Uh, and so I talked about, I, I actually drew the example of, of Natanya Lee and C. Williams' big project that they did, their Ear to the Ground project, where they went all around the United States uh, interviewing and talking to activists and organizers, um, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of different groups and really talking about, you know, what are their projects and, and what are the things that they're working on. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we can draw out of, of their report and, and just thinking about, uh, you know, capitalism more broadly is that there are uh, projects out there, projects that focus on democratization and redistribution and decommodification. These types of projects really do challenge the status quo. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of exciting things happening and, and there's a lot of potential because one of the reasons why, and I, you know, people who have read the book and, and liked it, one of the reasons why I think it resonates with them is that people also have these kinds of uh, critiques, right? And, and so it's a w about articulating the verse and, and thinking about the power of ideas to then, you know, form the basis for, for some for some actual, you know, radical projects. Have you found that people get upset when you um, criticize some of these iconic? people, because some of them are, are really widely loved. I mean, I'm thinking, I, I guess, especially I would, especially Oprah and Sheryl Sandberg, I think a lot of people really um, are, are, have an emotional attachment to them as, you know. I haven't, uh, I actually, so I've had some debates with women about Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, but as many women, I've actually had a surprising number of women that I've talked to say, you know, I actually secretly didn't really like her book. Uh, and now I feel more, more confident to say why I didn't like it. Um, one of the critiques I've actually gotten was, was uh, in, in my treatment of the Gates. I think a lot of people actually are, are much more supportive of Bill and Melinda Gates than I, than I expected, particularly uh, some of the work that they do overseas with their vaccine projects. I know. Um, How can you hate where, that? Yeah, that's actually where I've seen some of, some of the some of the the biggest uh, pushback. Um, but you know, the book is, hasn't been out for that long, so I'm sure I'm sure I'll uh, have have some more criticism. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the Gateses, though. Um, so I mean vaccinating kids against malaria really Nicole how can you hate on that <laughs> uh, the, well I guess I don't know if we have time to talk about the the, the whole Gates chapter but no you, you do um, one of the one of those one of the things I wanted to really emphasize in the in the Gates chapter and the Gates are certainly not alone they're part of a whole new kind of movement called philanthro capitalism which is really a mouthful I didn't make that up um, uh, and it's this idea of you know people like the Gates who have been wildly successful at, a, uh, at making money really want to sort of use the, the logic of, 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 of profit making to solve the problems of uh, global inequality and poverty and these things. Uh, so they really believe that the, the reason why children are, are dying from preventable diseases is that markets are not serving them uh, and that we need to actually create uh, capitalist healthcare markets. And, and they actually use the, the fund to, to, to try to uh, prop up the demand side. Uh, of 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 the, the the whole market, right? So they pay for vaccines to be created, and then they pay for governments to buy them, in the hopes that over the long run the governments will be able to purchase them uh, themselves. And I say in the book, obviously we should be doing anything and everything to prevent uh, people from dying from from diseases that we know how to cure, uh, obviously. But it becomes uh, a, a bit of a thorny problem when you have uh, someone like uh, Bill Gates or, or you know, the Gateses together because the amount of money they, they bring to bear is absolutely enormous. They have, the, the foundation has more money than the World Health Organization. Uh, but again, it is not a democratic, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is not a democratic uh, organization. We have no say in what they, what they spend their dollars on. And they're actually subsidized by taxpayers uh, because it's a charitable donation. Uh, yet we have no sort of way of, mm -hmm. of, of, of having any say in kind of what they're doing. 
So when you treat the problem of children dying from illness as a, as a market problem, you eliminate the possibility of treating healthcare as a right, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and, and universal healthcare is widely uh, reported by health experts all over the world as, uh, as a system that provides the best out health outcomes. Uh, but the Gates are squarely against universal healthcare, and they've said that on a number of, of occasions. Now you can say, well, they can do whatever they want with their money, uh, but the point is, is, it's not really just their money, right? Uh, the money that they've gained is, is, is through their business that, that, that they're not paying taxes on. Uh, and it's something that should be, you know, democratically decided, uh, 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 sort of what they're doing with this money. So it's, it's people get a little upset about, about that chapter, but I think it's, it's worth saying. This is something that is really important. I mean, you're not really saying that there's anything wrong with Bill and Melinda Gates um, helping children get vaccinated in um, in four countries, but what you're um, what what you're criticizing is a model for solving social problems, right? You know, which is that we depend on the whim of rich people to solve the social problems that they would like to in the way that they would like to. Yeah, right. I mean, absolutely. And, 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 and the kind of uh, foundation, the Gates Foundation is only the biggest, uh, but foundations have, a, and historically as well, they have a huge role to play uh, in, in actually uh, shaping the ideas uh, that we have about how to solve social problems and also channeling their money and deciding sort of who gets funded and what types of projects get funded. And they really can shape the terrain on which both, you know, basic medical research, but also activist organizations and NGOs, this all uh, then gets determined by these, you know, few groups, of course, educational reform, half the chapters on educational reform, uh, the amount of influence they have is, is phenomenal. And again, it's in their fundamentally, uh, you know, undemocratic, uh, undemocratic organizations. If they do things that don't turn out very well, there's no ramifications for them. Uh, and, and so I draw the uh, example of actually of Agro, which is this new uh, sort of green revolution uh, for Africa, which is a disastrous program, uh, which is trying to create private seed markets uh, uh, in a number of African countries. And again, lots of people have spoken out against this program, but there's really nothing they can do about it because, you know, these foundations like the Gates Foundation are so powerful uh, and have such uh, deep connections. Yeah, and, and no accountability. And no accountability. On the education, I mean, this is this is something that um, I follow a lot, and um, and I learned some things from your chapter. Um, they made an interesting. The Gates has made an interesting shift um, from focusing on um, reducing class sizes um, to um, something else. Why do um, the Gateses love education and hate teachers? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, everybody seems to be jumping on the, the hating teachers bandwagon, which is. Uh, which is unfortunate. I've had a lot of good teachers in my life. Um, but yeah, so the Gates originally were hoping to uh, improve uh, test scores, right, through reducing class size, uh, but they found that this didn't initially, this didn't work in the, the, they set up a couple thousand s smaller high schools. Uh, test scores were not improved, so they closed a bunch of the schools down and decided, uh, based on some, some uh, much of the research actually coming out of sociology, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, some, some research uh, showing that it's actually teachers who are the key kind of variable. Um, uh, in, in, in the, the test scores. Yeah, in, in improving test scores. Mm -hmm. And this sort of mythical, you know, top uh, percentile teachers would, would be able to improve test scores regardless of the school, of the city, of the, of the economic and, uh, background of the students. Uh, the key is really the teachers. And, and this, this becomes problematic for, for a number of reasons, most basically simply because it, it totally eliminates uh, what's going on outside the school. Uh, you know, when we have one in four children in the U.S. growing up in poverty, this now is not part of the story, right? We're focusing, uh, we're, we're focusing on teachers. But it, it, it fits with their same kind of uh, approach to all of their projects, which is this idea that if schools could be run according to a market logic, right, viewing the education process as a production process, 
uh, where the teacher is part of that and, and we want to increase the value that the teacher adds to the students, which is how they actually talk about the process. Um, and the output is test scores. Um, uh, this becomes very problematic, most, most simply because children are not inputs uh, and education is not a production process. Uh, but when we start to treat these things uh, according to this kind of market logic, you get really twisted outcomes, which people who are passionate about educational reform uh, have seen. I talked about a few examples in the chapter of schools like these KIPP schools, right? Knowledge is power schools, where children are really, um, you know, tr treated uh, in a way that is unconscionable. Uh, and that, you know, very wealthy people would never send their children to these schools. Their children go to Waldorf schools where they play uh, and, and build clay models until they're, uh, you know, uh, probably, uh, you know, s seven years old. But, and they uh, don't get any vaccinations. <laughs> But in the, you know, in these schools where you have children, you know, being taught to, uh, you know, nod in unison and spend hours in, in silence and be humiliated and debased on a, a daily basis, these are the types of uh, kind of perverse outcomes you see by trying to, you know, attach a market logic to something that has no business being seen uh, uh, in that way. So that's, you know, the, what I try to do with that chapter is, 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 is look at all of the different ways that their approach, right? Thinking about things uh, in terms of of a, of a market logic can can really create outcomes that are that are not desirable and certainly not solving the problems uh, that we want to solve. You know, try to improve our schools or or reduce inequality. Mm -hmm. You mentioned poverty, but but Gates, um, Bill Gates, has a theory about that, um, as you mentioned in the chapter. Um, he says that. Um, He's, he he poo poos the idea that um, that the problem with um, our schools is um, poverty. Um, he, um, he 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 says on the contrary, education is the solution mm -hmm. to poverty. Um, wh what do you wh what do you um, how do you respond to that? Well, obviously, I disagree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that there are always, again, it's this, that people can, can point to sort of outlier cases where you have a very bright student uh, who is extremely driven uh, and, and managed to make it through, uh, you know, through a poor school, uh, an underfunded school where the tax base is really low and, and achieves success. Uh, but this is, you know, we have to think statistically. Um, and, and, and certainly when we, when, we, when we look at the impact that poverty has on, on children, uh, it's really devastating and, and completely undermines their ability to uh, even uh, a, a, achieve uh, you know, a high school education, let alone go on to achieve a college degree, which is necessary uh, to, to uh, get any kind of job stability in, in today's economy. So it, it's, it's, it's a bit cynical, I think, to, to focus on, on the teacher. But, but it's a way, I mean, it, there's, there's a logic behind it, because teachers are, are very connected to students and communities and parents. Uh, they're really kind of the linchpin in the whole sort of public education model. Uh, and if you attack and, and devalue teachers, this becomes a way to really undermine people's faith uh, in public education and open the door for, you know, treating schools as businesses, right, that, that should compete with, uh, on the same kind of logic as other businesses. And so I, it's, 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 it's certainly strategically uh, smart, and I can see why the kids do it. I, 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 I think that's right. I, um, I, I, though, with a, with a statement like that, it, it is so... It is, it is so incomprehensible that on a policy level he could really think that. Um, you know, that I mean, there's just no way that education can solve the problem of poverty on a, on a large scale. And, and it's actually sort of um, really um, hard to believe that he actually believes that. And, and you know, I was so, um, I, I think you do a really great job in your book of, um, of allowing us to understand that these prophets are mostly sincere um, in their beliefs. You know that they are. That, you know that that, um, that they mostly do really believe um, in um, the um, neoliberal message that they're um, that they're selling, and that they really do believe that um, if um, tweaked in this way, um, they're um, that it can really make the world a better place. Um, you know, with statements like that from Bill Gates, though, I have to wonder, I, I mean, you use the word cynical, and 
I, I, I'd like you to unpack that a little bit because it seems very cynical to me. I do, cannot believe that somebody as um, somewhat smart as Bill Gates can actually sincerely believe that education can lift um, um, people out of poverty. I think that he must um, view it as a um, meritocratic sorting mechanism that needs to be made to sort people more efficiently. Um, that is, seems like the best that we can possibly um, read that statement. But what do you I think? Like, I like that phrase, a meritocratic <laughs> sorting mechanism. Um, yeah, I, I, I really do believe uh, that, that the, the prophets in the book do believe in what they're saying. And that's why I actually chose yeah. them. Uh, they mm -hmm. do believe in the, the message. Now, and it's very convincing. I mean, you're, the, way that you can, the way that you render them, they are very sympathetic characters on that level alone. Yeah, because certainly we could point to many, many billionaires who do nothing but keep their money yeah. and buy islands. And uh, uh, you know, when, when we look at people like uh, Steve Jobs, for example, or, or or Jeff Bezos, and all of these kinds of people questioning sort of you know what 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 they are doing, but. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Bill Gates' head. <laughs> but when we, when we think when we think about uh, the question of teachers, I think he really genuinely believes that teachers are standing in the way of progress, uh, and this is and this is uh, you know in line with the broader kind of uh, you know neoliberal message of, of flexibility uh, and 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 treating you know workers as something that w is that that are there to sort of add value to 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 the enterprise and and teachers don't do that right they they they're 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 an intimate part of our children's lives they they spend so much time with our children uh, and and I think he just that's that's not part of the story mm -hmm. uh, but really that's one of the the the, the the parts of the story that has the most possibility. I mean, if we look at the Chicago Teachers Union and all of the organizing that's going on now uh, to, to fight against precisely some of the things I'm talking about in the chapter, I think it's really heartening and people are, are, are really kind of standing up and saying, no, we don't want our children to be seen as inputs and education is not a production process. So I think there's some really interesting things happening there. A, a lot of kids didn't take the tests, um, the state tests in New York this um, this year, and that's been happening all over the country. Yeah, it's happening so. in Cambridge, actually, uh, in Massachusetts. They, they tried to implement a second uh, standardized test, uh, and, and there was a huge uh, uproar from parents, and they actually uh, stopped stopped it. So it's, 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 it's a good, it's, a, it's an interesting time. Yeah. Um, so I was actually going to say I think that's a good note to open it up to um, questions from the um, from the audience. I think you you have a, a pretty good um, sense um, of the book, not as good a sense as you will have by buying it and reading it, which you should do. Um, but um, I'd love to take questions. Uh, the, the, the consolation of history is that a hundred years from now, people look back at the things that Bill Gates and Over are saying and say what complete bollocks they were, and those people were nuts. Um, why don't, I mean, why doesn't that happen now? I mean, why is there, why is it, I guess this is more a motive question than an intellectual one, but why, how is it that such, you know, complete nonsense is the sort of things that Oprah and, and Bill Gates say, you know, blame the teachers? How do, you know, where's the counter narrative to that? <laughs> Well, that's part of the question, right? And so part of the desire with this book is to start, a, start to create that counter-narrative. I think one of the, the deepest, you know, the reason why these stories are so appealing to people is because people do have a desire for change. They have a desire to change, uh, you know, to fix some of the problems that we're seeing in capitalism. But there's really a big question mark about how to do that. Uh, and a lot of the kind of movements and ideas of the past were really discredited with the sort of counter-revolution of the 1980s. And, and workers and working class movements are really weak right now. Uh, the, the sort of alternative message is, is, not, uh, is not really there yet. Uh, and so that's part of something that has to be built to, to pull out you know, uh, sort of what we want and get over this kind of hurdle of fatalism to think the world can't be any different than it is right now. Uh, and sort of to start talking about <laughs> ideas that really question that fundamental premise that we don't have to just sort of, you know, tweak the status quo or refine the system as the gates say, but really start to ask fundamental questions about some of the things we take for granted. I mean, if you were to do another book looking at 
new profits of capital in other countries, do you think you'd come to different conclusions? Or, or to what extent is this particular to the U.S.? Well, it's, uh, it, this is very particular to the United States, and I talk a lot, it's probably worth just for a minute unpacking uh, the term neoliberalism, uh, just to, to talk about it. New, you know, when we often talk about neoliberal capitalism, it's just kind of a catch-all term that references particular practices and ideas. Uh, but in every country, uh, there's, very, there's different sets of practices and ideas, and, and, and people talk to, you know, they draw from different, a kind of different cultural narrative. Uh, but I do think that in every, you know, if we looked at different places around the world, you would find, uh, you know, profits of capital, if we want to call them that. Uh, but I think that they might be saying things in a different way because one of the ways that capital evolves over time is to draw from uh, sort of narratives and ideas that exist outside the profit relation. And so this is, of course, different in every place because, you know, every place is different. Uh, but it's an interesting question, right? We can start to think about other examples. I gave the example just in a footnote of, you know, we can think of Bono. He, he would be a good profit of capital. Uh, um, but, you know, people, you can think of other, ex other examples from other countries. Um, well, you talked about how the Gates Foundation sort of by all rights should be run in a more democratic way because they have nonprofit status, they don't pay taxes and all that. So I guess I just wonder like, so what do you want to do with the Gates Foundation? Like use policy to somehow democratize it or is like is that a good place to start from by making a better Gates Foundation or do you want to sort of chuck it and <laughs> start start with something else. I don't think the foundation model is anything that should be uh, e existing uh, uh, because it's it's basically using money that should be taxed and, and thrown into the the general pot to uh, to be doing whatever the foundation uh, heads want. I think that the the money should be taxed as it was in the post World War II period and, and put into democratic uh, institutions. So we could think about that uh, on a national level, you know, uh, in, in particular countries or on a global level if we think. About about organizations like the World Health Organization is certainly not perfect, uh, but that's where the money should be ch channeled to uh, uh, at this point, and then work to democratize, you know, those types of institutions. So I don't think the goal should be to, uh, ch you know, sort of improve the Gates Foundation. It should be to challenge the whole system of foundations as as they exist. Um, I, th I think um, Nicole makes a very good argument in her book for um, foundations as as a kind of a a symptom of a failure of expropriation, right? I mean, if if these people were properly taxed, they would they wouldn't um, be so rich, and there would be no foundations, and that is that would itself be much more democratic, right? Because um, then um, the then the, the state and presumably the people that we elected would be making some decisions. Uh, well, one of the reasons why I think the Gates Foundation and um, um, Mar uh, Marissa Mayer and um, everybody that you listed has such a pervasive message is because they're so easily accessible and they are, um, like their message is widely received. And for smaller companies that might um, be decommodifying and um, separating themselves from capitalism, their message isn't as widely received and people don't know about it. So. What is your take on that, and how do you get people to break away from the message that Oprah is um, is projecting? Because it's the easiest and most it's like the lowest hanging fruit for people to. Yeah, and that's a key. That's a really key point that you're making. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we are talking about these people because they have access to giant media machines. Uh, the Gates in particular, I mean, of course, Sandberg has access uh, to a media machine through Facebook, uh, but, and the Gates, you know, they have a really slick, it's not just that the message is heard, it's heard in a really nicely uh, produced, uh, you know, s kind of uh, easy to digest way. And so this is one of the big challenges. But I think if we look back through history, uh, we, we see many, many examples of, of, you know, ordinary people organizing and challenging these kinds of uh, voices and really challenging the, the dominance of these voices from the top. And, and we see it time and again, when you have people organizing their workplaces and their communities, they can really drown out some of these uh, pervasive ideas and, and voices through, through struggle. But it's, you know, the first
first thing I think, and and the only sort of small thing I'm trying to do in this in this book is to actually sort of disconnect those stories from really radical stories, and because a lot of people will will sort of not make a distinction between you know their own feminist project and maybe Sandberg's project, which I, I think it's necessary to do as the first as the first uh, step. Um, how do you think uh, philanthropic capitalism will evolve um, over these next few decades? So Matthew Matthew Bishop and uh, I'm blanking on his first name Green. Uh, they actually have a whole book on phil philanthropic capitalism, and one of the interesting things they find is that they are that we're in the fifth uh, peak period of, of, of philanthropic capitalism throughout the history of capitalism. Uh, and they find that it coincides with periods of uh, extreme wealth creation over time and also extreme polarization. Uh, you have these periods of extreme inequality created in a very short, short space of time. So uh, foundations emerge to deal with some of these types of problems, these extreme uh, instances of inequality. Um, but of course, the sort of the the stability of capitalism uh, is, is, is really challenged when you have this rapid uh, and, 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 and sort of vicious inequalities emerge. So, I mean, the, I don't see any waning of, 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 of foundations as long as, as, as people don't sort of get into the streets and demand uh, a decrease in inequality uh, or, or a change in, in the tax codes. Because that's, there, we see more and more foundations emerging all the time because we have super elites who are really worried about the political consequences of this uh, increasing inequality. So I think once once people actually start to demand taxation uh, and, and 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 some other sort of uh, steps to reduce inequality, that's really one of the w one of the ways that we're going to start to see the 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 foundation world, uh, you know, at least. Uh, be constricted, but it's really it's really linked to these broader broader processes in capitalism. Do you think that also the the cultural acceptance of it is linked to the idea that a it's generous, so we should always be really grateful that these people are giving back. I mean, and because I I, I have often written critical things about philanthropy um, myself, and I find people people really. Um, bristle at that because you know this is very generous of these rich people to be doing this and um, and and then and then also it's the um, the confidence that people have I mean I think one of the reasons your book is so important is that um, we're living in a time where people are incredibly confident um, that rich people are rich um, and and that successful people are successful because they're brilliant and they know things that the rest of us don't know, right? So I think that's that's also part of the challenge, right? Of of um, of confronting philanthropic capitalism is that you know we have to um, stop um, convince people that um, these people are not superhumans who have um, all the answers. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's this weird juxtaposition of sort of we're, we're idolizing these people who have made billions of dollars while at the same time have very little faith in our own kind of elected governments to provide these things for us. But they're, of course, uh, linked. Right, uh, and and when we when we deem what the gates do as generosity, uh, really it's important to just remind people that it's it's not generous. We we are subsidizing uh, their their coffers, um, and 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 to remind people that it used to be that that money went to to the state to actually provide uh, the things that we used to expect the state to provide. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's it's definitely again this kind of it's it's necessary to actually challenge some of these ideas, but in of course in challenging them to actually build that challenge into sort of organizing, right? To not uh, to s not to separate sort of ideas and organizing. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was wondering if you could speak to the uh, so-called like rebel billionaire phenomenon that you see in figures like Mark Cuban and um, Richard Branson, figures like that. I mean. I, I, I'm not sure if you've addressed that in your book or if you could speak to it. Uh, what about them? Sort of why, why, why uh, we're so they, enamored they, with them? Yeah, if, why we're, why we're, if they fit into your schema, if they qualify as prophets of capitalism, because they seem to be pretty uh, increasingly prevalent. And it, 
Um, I think probably Branson could probably be considered a... I don't know too much about uh, Richard Branson, but he could probably be deemed... I, I know he's involved in various charity projects. Um, but, you know, again, this kind of celebrity status, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, you know, artifact of the last uh, few decades, certainly, this kind of... Uh, but again, it's, 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 it's what you're saying too, Liza, this idea that there's something magical about these people, uh, that they've managed to accumulate so much wealth uh, and power that there really must be something special about them uh, and, 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 and that gives them sort of the right to sort of do these audacious things. Uh, and, and I don't know about all of the rebel billionaires because not all of them actually profess to want to make the world a better place, but certainly those who, who are sort of using their money to implement their action plans, we, we would consider them prophets of capital too. Again, to Nicole and Liza and Jack Hood Magazine. Um, once more, the Profits of Capital is available at the register. We hope you'll pick up a copy. Um, Nicole's going to sign books too, so uh, we invite you all to stick around. Thanks very much. <laughs>